Hi, I'm Brian Vines, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2023 Brooklyn Book Festival's Virtual Festival Day for a conversation with Aparna Nantrella and Samantha Irby. If you're in New York City next week, the in-person festival takes place on October 1st in downtown Brooklyn. Before we begin, I want to let you know that the books by authors in this program can be purchased in the link below. With that, I'm going to get right into our conversation, and I'd love to bring into the room Samantha Irby. Irby. Samantha Irby. Do I need to do that again? Or no. What? Okay. <laughs> We'll leave it all this in. Samantha Irby is a humorist and essayist and the author of four essay collections, including the recent release, Quietly Hostile. And Aparna Nantrola is a comedian, actress, and writer based in Los Angeles. Her stand-up has appeared on Two Queens on HBO and a plethora of other places we're sure you're all familiar with, some of which are not currently on strike. And we want to welcome... <laughs> Both of you, thank you so much for spending some time with the Brooklyn Book Festival today. Thanks thank for inviting you. us. Yeah, thank you for having us here. What an honor. Truly. And thank you so, for not making me come to Brooklyn. <laughs> thank you for so letting no us. No one ever. Here. How dare you not come to Brooklyn? <laughs> Well, we'll New start Yorkers right. love New York, but those of us from the Midwest, you know. Excuse me, I'm a Chicago boy, 60651 here. So oh. I have oh, then you are a traitor. My high school, no, no, my college roommate next door, neighbor, I guess, my dorm neighbor was from ETHS, so he was an Evanston boy. You will be happy to know. So I'm my thrilled boy, to know. Roots, Runs. Unless he was an asshole, then I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> from not the Midwest. I'm, I'm not from the Midwest, but I've been told I have a Midwest accent. So, does that count? Yes. Yeah. I, okay. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and you're nice. I mean, the the thing you have to be is nice, even if it's fake, and then you can pass as a Midwesterner. That's true. That's big in LA too. Nice mm -hmm. but fake. Yeah. But ours is real nice, but sometimes right. theirs is like <laughs> a manufactured nice. That's true. Yeah. But the but fakeness, the fakeness is real in LA. <laughs> This is the real thing. So we've already begun with laughter, but this is laughing through life, humor, heart, and honest reflections. So that that is a heavy mantle, but it's something that both of you have woven easily into your works, whether they're the most recent things that we're talking about right now or just in your history. So we've talked a little bit just cursory about where we're all from, but I would love to ask each of you how your humor and how your takes on life, your outlook has been informed by the places from which you're from. Like Aparna, I know in your book, you talked about being in like Northern Virginia in the DC area and being aware of your differences, but you had a mirror, but you didn't know that you were not white. Yeah, and Sam being in this like very ritzy suburban enclave, but not being of the whole thing. So I would love if each of you would sort of share about your like insider outsider perspective and how that might have informed your takes. Aparna, you want to go first? <laughs> okay. Oh, or I can. I would no, yeah, I'll go yeah. first since okay. it seems okay. like I put you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. I was trying to be polite, but it felt aggressive. <laughs> um, <laughs> see, that's the Evanston, Illinois in me coming out immediately, like <laughs> thinking that I've done something bad. Um, I think when you grow up adjacent to wealth without having any, and you can see other people's lives that are not like, your own you could either like <laughs> be sad all the time which um uh, I was a lot or you just have to find a way to like 
get through it. And for me, developing a sense of humor was sort of like, well, this helps me get through things, but also I can deflect the jokes from people who, I mean, kids are so uncharitable, right? Like even the nice kids are like, mm, your shoes are from Payless. And it's like, I could crumble every time somebody pointed out that I was wearing, you know, like Adidas or whatever, like, <laughs> you know, knock off shoes or I could say something back and eat and self-deprecate self-deprecation for me was the easiest way because you don't look like an asshole it's like if I make the joke first I'm not picking on you and it sort of takes the teeth out of whatever you're gonna say about me and so I Evanston I'm from Evanston which is a suburb just north of Chicago and it's a great place to grow up. I had access to, I mean, I didn't continue my education much past going to high school there. Uh, so it has made me what I am. But I think just in order to keep from weeping every day, it was like, if I can turn this into a joke, mm -hmm. then it doesn't feel as bad. And that's where it, that's where the funny came from. Uh, great answer really good uh <laughs> i feel like you don't get enough feedback in these sessions you mm. know it's just like yeah. okay and what's your answer so i thought i would give you that's some. No, that made me feel really good <laughs> okay <laughs> good. my head nod will just have to suffice since the audience is not present now <laughs> Um, so yes, I also grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in Northern Virginia outside of DC and my parents were both immigrants. They were both doctors. So I feel like class wise, I was raised, you know, sort of middle class, upper middle class. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily that that set me apart from because it was kind of a, you know, conservative, like upper class suburb. But I do feel like the thing that separated me was kind of being a kid of immigrants and feeling very out of step culturally and like not knowing what people were talking about a lot a lot of the time and not like wearing the right clothes um and you know i would i would just feel like everyone else sort of had this pamphlet or information that they were privy to that i never got so and I was also a really shy kid. So I would say like, I didn't, humor didn't really enter the picture for me until later because to be, to know you're funny, you kind of need an audience. And I think I was too afraid to really seek that audience early on. I was more the person absorbing what the class clown was doing and taking notes and being like, this is really working for them. I'm going <laughs> to, you know, maybe utilize this later. I almost feel like my humor came in like the way you write, um, the, the, the way you think of a bunch of snappy comebacks, like when you're in a situation much later that you should have said, like that was sort of like I wrote all my snappy comebacks from adolescence as a, you know, late 20 year old. And then I was like, and now I can monetize these. So, it's great. <laughs> so you talk about the uh, like needing folks to be there to realize that you were funny and you've already given the preview so Aparna when did you realize that you were funny like was it when you made that alchemy and stepped in front of an audience or how did you come to the concept that yeah I'm I'm, I'm funny yeah I mean I was a shy kid as I said so my mom you know like a lot of immigrant mom she was kind of like afraid of my ability to make it in the world and she was always kind of trying to push me out of my shell so one thing she did was sign my sibling and I up for public speaking classes like as children <laughs> she was like this is a valuable soft skill that you will be able to use for a lifetime so we were like in this public speaking class it was like all adults and us and we learned how to you know talk about you know any topic at length I think it was called Toastmasters and then after we graduated the class we entered like a we both entered a community speech contest and I remember the topic was like what is an issue you feel facing the Indian commun American community today like a crucial issue or something and everyone else went with you know like 
bigotry or assimilation or you know being a kid of immigrants and I decided to go the more humorous route I I went I did a takedown of Bollywood movies which I had a lot of resentment towards at the time as someone who was forced to watch them at home and didn't uh, speak Hindi so I didn't know what was going on at all so I think there was just a lot of built-up anger there so I did this like rant about Bollywood movies but you know I tried to put some jokes in there and it went over really well. And I think um, that was the first time I sort of had made a room full of people laugh. And I think it just felt like, oh, my gosh, like, what is this? Like, the power was just immediately intoxicating. Yeah. So you had it yeah. seven as an adolescent. You were. You had yeah. Yeah. And stole the but so I know you had some like. In, in Chicago, like legendary late night uh, epic sort of shows that were happening with storytelling and folks coming into the room. But did you consider yourself, because like you're not a stand-up, but did you consider yourself funny? Was it in the delivery or in the writing that you found humor? I think both. I think when you read my things on the page, they're funny. But hearing me deliver them, I have, I mean, this is going to sound so gross, but I have, like, pretty good timing. Um, <laughs> so I think it was a combination of the two. I am too, um, I'm too much of a big sensitive baby to do stand up because the audience is encouraged to uh, be mean to the performer and, like, <laughs> come on I can't uh -uh, I can't do that um and so when when I got into storytelling like Chicago has a pretty like vibrant storytelling scene I was like oh this is great especially because most people show up to those events like you know thinking you're gonna tell like a sad story about like your grandmother's hat that she pass down to you and whatever so that and there were some things like that and then I show up and I'm like so I was pissing on this guy and people are like <laughs> huh? what and then like they start laughing and that was that's like really where I found my sweet spot is just in these shows what well, before anyone knew who I was it was unexpected but then when people knew like what I got up and talked about it was like well okay oh you like the piss story well this one's about shit and like it just it became uh addictive is the wrong word but very validating like in my like at least the things I was going through that sucked could be sort of alchemized into something funny for an audience I have to say just as a person in the world I have this is the first book of yours that I have read because I've always listened to the audio version. Oh. So it's very funny because, because I got the copy through the Brooklyn Book Festival. Thank, thank you, Brooklyn Book Festival. <laughs> yes, and thank you. First time I've ever seen your words written down where you haven't been like in my ear making me laugh on a subway full of people. Do you have so, a preference? For, I definitely have a preference. I want to hear you tell me the story. Like when Michelle Obama released her books or any like person of note in the world is sharing something like I have the book, but it's a doorstop just so people know I'm not a dummy. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, um, that's like me buying the Barack Obama book being like, <laughs> all of them. the NAACP <laughs> is forcing me, but I'm not going to read this. <laughs> <laughs> the brown tax. Like you can't show up in the world and like be a brown person and not have those things on the shelf somewhere. Yes. But I love hearing the person tell it as it happened to them. So I like I own the books, but I listen to the books so I can get into it. So I would love to ask both of you about voice because I do hear your voice and your timing, and it goes beyond punctuation and the marks there. So I want to start with you, Aperna. I just saw something you talking about, like developing, writing this book and doing voiceover work, both of which are activities that can be done in a cave. So now that you're in the world presenting them, as you were writing, some of the funniest parts 
are like in the parentheses in the little asides where I don't know if in book tones it's breaking a fourth wall where you're like going along but you're dropping things and I can see you turning to me and saying I get it this is a laugh line so I wonder in the writing for both of you the use of punctuations or just technique how do you get that voice onto the page so I can still hear both of you while it's being read yeah I I mean some of it I think comes from performing because I think especially with stand-up, you learn to kind of be more conversational than you might if you were like writing, yeah, like a speech or something. So I think those little asides and like quirks kind of come from the way you would talk to a friend where you're kind of, you know, embellishing as you go and adding like just these little things that that would happen as a normal aside in a conversation. So I think that kind of develops just from having performed on stage a bunch. But I noticed when I was reading the audiobook that I, I was like, oh my gosh, I should have read this out loud more when I was writing it. Because when I read it out loud as the audiobook, it kind of felt like the first time I was really reading it out loud. And I was just like, oh no, this is not conversational enough for me. Yeah, that happens it's, it's like a weird medium that has happened every single time I record about like I write a lot of run-on sentences because they're yeah. funny and I, still I am my own worst enemy because I'll get in the booth and be reading it and be like oh my god where can I breathe without <laughs> it sounding like I am gasping for air I, I think I tend to write pretty conversationally. And my favorite thing when like reading on stage is, you know, when you can feel the audience, like if the audience is really rowdy, you can tell they want you to like slip a little something extra mm -hmm. in there or lean into this thing or like, you know, pull back and make fun of yourself while reading. And so I try to do that on the page and I got to say like parentheses and ellipses are good tools as is the caps lock but that makes people very mad um <laughs> I still try to do it as much as possible uh but yeah thank god for punctuation to try to at least give the reader an idea of like okay this is me sort of pulling you aside even though I'm telling you the story, I'm going to tell you this little secret part too. And uh, the copy editor does not like it, but you know, what are we going to do? I got to use a lot of parentheses. <laughs> Why does Caps Lock make people mad? Sorry, Brian. Sorry. No, I mean, because they feel like you're shouting. People oh. love to get mad about any stylistic choice oh. i think the people who get mad about that stuff at least for me are people who had no idea what they were picking up oh and, yeah you know i and, feel like that's such a generation <laughs> that's like a old pardon to the agent among us but that feels like a very old way of like why are you yelling it's like it's just emphasis like it's like, yeah it's affect come on we're we're joking here this isn't the iliad we can shout. <laughs> so do you, do each of you, do, do you read the book out loud as you're, because it's like these tight collections of essays. And like, I, I come to this question because I used to work in TV news and I like write scripts to be written or to be read out loud. Right. So like, I'm much to the chagrin of the person sitting next to me. I have to say it as I'm writing it and say it out loud. And I wonder if either of you engage in a practice like that at all, or if you're just like down in it writing. I think if I ever write another book, I will do that more because I think I should have done it more. And I didn't when I was writing this book, because I think I did at the beginning. And then by the fourth or fifth draft, I was like, every time I look at this, I'm enraged. And so I didn't want to read it out loud, let alone read it at all. So I, but I think in the future, I'm like, I think reading out loud really helps me edit because I also love a run on sentence. And, and I think when you say it out loud, you're like, oh, maybe I don't need 60% uh, <laughs> of these words. Yes. 
I should, I mean, I'm four books deep and I should read them aloud. And yet every time it's audiobook time, I'm like sweating in that carpeted closet, like thinking to myself, why didn't I just like one time, why didn't I just sit down and make sure this flows the way I want it to? Uh, at this point, I'm not going to change. Yeah. I wish, I wish, I hope someone could like set a spell, cast a spell on me so that I could like change my approach. But I feel like I'm still going to end up in the booth every book being like, oh my God, why didn't I read this to someone? <laughs> Well, you your secret is safe with me because I find that startling because it flows so well and it doesn't seem like so. God oh, bless those thank you. We we have had to do uh, many takes sometimes <laughs> when I'm like, oh wait, I landed on that word wrong. Yeah. You know, well, thank thank goodness for uh, the the engineers. <laughs> it is a process. So I would love to, while I'm with you, like talk about process. I heard you say that you, you've never taken a writing class. Like this is something that Samantha has in her that's come out at least four other times uh, in the books and in performance. So I would love to know what the process of for both of you now writing tv versus writing a book and then i'll take it a step further and go into live performance like for all of the bookish types here and folks who aspire to or have been writing their great work for a long time what is the difference in that process for each of you well i would say my books, I, I jokingly, but it's true, I jokingly call them like printed out blogs. They truly mm -hmm. are like blogs with an editor. I, I have no fancy writer tricks right. up my sleeve. I am mystified every time they let me write another one. I'm like, oh, Oh, you're going to give me some more money to do this again? <laughs> yeah, sure. Huh? Um, so I think the the book writing process, I have a, and I don't take this for granted, I have a pretty long leash now because, I'm honestly, because like my books sell. And so <laughs> I don't get a lot of, but you know, like no one tells me what to write. I don't even have to tell them what I'm going to write. I just turn it in and I'm like, uh, I wrote about QVC. There's like 10,000 words in there about QVC. Hope you, hope you like it. Um, so the, the book thing, I truly just like, I, I get a deadline. I run all the way up to that deadline. And then I'm like, what should I put in here? And then like, I come up with, with things for TV because I've never uh, been like executive producer and been the one to call the shots. Uh, I mostly, it's like you get an outline, you know, you put together an outline, you know what you're supposed to do. You turn it in and then, whatever ends up on screen sometimes it's exactly what i wrote more often than not it's different than what i wrote and so that for me is almost easier because i feel like oh well it's in their hands now you know what i mean like oh i i turned that into michael patrick king and he's gonna either make carrie bradshaw say that stuff or not um and the stage i just I truly just try to have fun with the audience. Like I kind of like to have a, you know, like a flirty, sexy relationship for five minutes with people on stage. And so I just write what I want and then let sort of the crowd dictate like how we go through the story together. So Aparna, have yours, has your television writing experience been mostly in writer's rooms or this sort of solo journey where you hand it in and just tune in friends to watch what made it from your brain to the character's mouth? 
No, it's been more in writers' rooms. I wrote uh, for a couple late night shows early on, and that would usually be like a show with a host. Like I wrote for Totally Biased with, with W. Kamau Bell and Late Night with Seth Meyers. And I learned pretty quickly that, uh, you know, one thing you have to be able to do as a TV writer for those types of shows is, you know, write in the host's voice. And I feel like, you know, I have a pretty specific voice and I would write, try to write jokes for them. And they'd always be like, this just sounds like a Barna wrote it <laughs> and only a Barna can say it. So I'm like, oh, I guess I can't channel like, you know, a white man or a black <laughs> man. Like I just... I can only live my own experience. So I think that made me know that like as a stand up, like it, it is so nice to just be able to write for yourself and write from your own point of view. But I think what made me want to write a book is that I was having trouble with performance anxiety and getting on stage. So I was like, okay, I'm going to have to pivot to another medium for now because like touring is feeling not like an option for me for the foreseeable future. And I also think with the book, you it felt like for me, I wanted to write something that could be a little messier and maybe more in the gray areas than you can typically be with stand up where you only have so much real estate to make your point and to keep the audience's attention. And you sort of have to always go out with a punchline. And I was like, maybe I want to not always have the punchline. And that was really scary, it turns out. But uh, but yeah, the book was my attempt to, you know, be a little serious I guess the actors when actors are like I'm gonna try drama <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk to both of you about uh, an idea that you spoke about in an interview I read Aparna about commodifying mental health issues struggles all of the things that are sort of uh, present in both of your work and transferring them into, I guess, a commodity as, uh, as you stated it earlier. But I wonder just about getting out into the world with those things and releasing them. Like what part of the continuum that puts you on for those of us who do struggle with performance anxiety, anxiety period, this concept of imposter syndrome. And we like live with these things, but we don't have a sort of universal release that each of you are privy to by way of your work. So I wonder what you might have insight into from that release that the rest of us may not on the scale that you're able to release those things. Okay, I'm gonna say that because I write a lot about, um, I have Crohn's disease, which if people don't know what it is, they can Google. Although there are like commercials for Crohn's disease on TV now, so maybe everyone's an expert, um, but. I would love I, to see one of you the write things... a commercial for Crohn's disease. Yeah, me too. Well, I, <laughs> listen, I wish they would put me in one. It's like my dream to get like a toilet paper deal or <laughs> I don't know, Sky Rizzy or whatever. Oh, like man. I am ready to sell out to Big Pharma um, and get my meds <laughs> for free. But um, I think for me, one of the... I think one of the things that brings me the most relief, because people are always like, oh man, how could you like it doesn't it feel like scary to tell all this stuff to the world and it's like well not really because I feel like it's less that I have to feel ashamed of or tell someone privately you know what I mean I don't have to have the birth it's like listen when you meet me if you are if you know anything I've done you're gonna know that if I tell you I have to go to the bathroom I'm gonna be gone for 45 minutes and like order apps for yourself and get your phone out right like <laughs> it just it sort of does I feel like my work opens a lot of doors it, not like I mean professionally too but just interpersonally it kind of breaks down a lot of walls for me so I don't have to do that like we can we can just dive right in you know enough about me let tell me about you you already know what I have going on and that has been uh 
honestly like a big relief like moving through the world having this information out there not and like the feeling of people who also go through the same thing being like thanks for talking about that that makes me feel better like validates doing it so it's been like incredibly freeing I think to talk about this stuff and have it out in the world and to like meet people who understand what I'm going through right off the bat yeah I think intellectually as uh someone who has uh struggles with anxiety and depression I know lots of other people do like it's so much in the zeitgeist now uh for better or for worse but I think when you experience those things you still just have those moments where you're like nobody understands me no one else could possibly know what this is like so I think writing about it is my way of getting a little bit outside my own head sometimes and remembering that other people are having this exact same experience or a very similar one uh but for me I also have to remember that um writing about something and like being honest about it in a performance way is not the same as like dealing with it in my own life like I've had to make that designation where it is like telling a bunch of strangers about my anxiety is not the same thing as like working on it with my therapist or like (laughs) like doing a strategy for it on my own like I, I think I uh yeah in a way it is almost like easier to tell a bunch of strangers sometimes because it's like then I don't have to address my like fear of true intimacy with like a loved one <laughs> All right. thank you for that yeah wonder if you have not advice I would never like ask you to say it, but a message for people or something who do struggle with social anxiety or depression or any of those other things that seem to follow funny people and comedians around, it seems. But folks who just aren't funny, who experience these things and don't get that release, it's like, God, I got the depression, but not the funny to go along with it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, being funny is not everyone's journey and they shouldn't no one should feel pressured to turn I mean like honestly I'm sure if my psychiatrist logged into this call she'd be like actually I think what Samantha does is really unhealthy and I wish she would Uh take her meds and shut the fuck up so I would say like you don't have to make your depression funny if that's not what works for you like there are some people who like exercise their anxiety away not me I couldn't tell you how that works or how to even start or what to do so I I would say like not to feel pressure to process if even if we have similar things the same way that we do like whatever works for you unfortunately for me it works like to talk about my you know vagina in public but that doesn't have to be everyone's yeah. way. Yeah, I think especially now with like social media and stuff, we're we're in a very like moment, uh, cultural moment where like performance or like perfor- the like front facing authenticity mm-hmm. is very much in. So it's like if you're processing your anxiety, can you do it through song or dance or you know with a full face of hair and makeup like? that doesn't that doesn't equate worth like views are not like just because you know a bunch of people is buying your art that doesn't mean I am like somehow processing my my stuff in a more healthy way or yeah mm-hmm. as Sam said it's probably a more doesn't unha- fix you. healthy <laughs> way <laughs> so yeah I I would say it's yeah it's to me it's just like a separation of like what I write about and talk about on stage is not at all the same as like how I'm handling it in my real life um like me making a joke about anxiety does not mean I have like a grip on it currently yeah yeah so I'm wondering about another process question you've each written these books but you've never not been contributing to the zeitgeist and so social media like you're both like dropping hot takes on the twitter machine I'm sorry X uh, or 
<laughs> Instagram, keeping us abreast of what Judge Mathis is doing day <laughs> by day. So there's like all of these things, like how much has social media, like, is it like a constant fire that's keeping your creative juices going? Or does it feel like a tax that you have to just stay in to stay relevant? I wonder about each of your relationships to contributing to social. Yeah. Well, I, I got off Twitter like a couple years ago because I couldn't do it. And I got off Facebook before that. I love Instagram. I feel like I have a, oh God, that sounds like so, like a loser. <laughs> like I love Instagram. But what? like <laughs> Instagram works for me. First of all, people are so funny. Um, Like I, I love a meme. I love a meme account. I mean, people are really funny and it, like it brings me joy and I love watching videos of like people falling down or, you know, whatever pops up. Um, I think if I had to maintain a Facebook presence and a Twitter presence and like was forced to uh, engage with platforms that I don't enjoy, I would hate it. But because like I keep my Instagram light, all I do is joke. We have fun together. It's like, it feels um, less, like, it doesn't feel like a burden to have an Instagram presence. And I can't, I don't think I could ever fully shit on social media because I don't think a career like mine is possible without it. Like, you know, in 2008, when I first started blogging, well, I mean, first of all, I started on a blog, right? <laughs> And Facebook was the only way to get the word out. And that's how I started to build an audience. But I don't, I, my relationship to it, like, I don't think anyone who follows me would ever be like, oh my God, Sam doesn't stop selling. Like, I don't sell anything. I, you know, I just, I try to like let people into my actual life and like talk about stuff and I think it's I mean it's pretty fun I would be sad if I had to get off Instagram yeah yeah I I also owe a lot to I think Twitter I joined in maybe 2008 and I also feel like it was the first thing that got me noticed in sort of a bigger way of either I would get my first job opportunities through it or just got connected with people in entertainment that I don't know how I would have met uh, in any other way. So I think I do owe a lot to it, but then I really burned out on it. I think maybe just a couple years ago, maybe post 2016, uh, pre pandemic, like I think I just wasn't, it wasn't fun anymore. And I think it was just something about the platform change, but I also was just like, this feels like it's not healthy in my life anymore like the way I'm relating to it and the way I'm using it creatively um I've really taken a step back from social media personally like Facebook Twitter and Instagram like I almost feel like the opposite of you Sam in that I'm like all I do is sell stuff all I've done is promote this book and mm -hmm. and it's all like that's it and it like really a bot could run my account and it would <laughs> be <laughs> Like, I'm so sorry to my followers. I'm like, if you are hoping for fun or insider content on my life, it's it's grim. It's grim right now. It's a grim period. But you'll come out of, like, the sales part, and then you could, like, go back to being normal. It's just a yeah. natural cost of doing what we do is that like once every few years I have to be like hey I wrote a book please buy it or I'll die and then you can like go back to right right <laughs> to right 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 shit. well unreliable narrator is a lovely book that is worthy of all the promotion and praise that it is received and I would love to ask both of you like social media was something that was a gateway for both of you in some ways, but 
how would you do it right now if you were a 15 year old sitting in your room in Evanston or somewhere in the suburbs of Northern Virginia, if you had to do it right now all over again, how would one construct a career that might put them on a trajectory to reach what both of you have? Oh my gosh, I oh cannot imagine God. trying to even <laughs> conceive of a career at 15, let alone social media. I'm so glad social media didn't exist oh, when I was 15. I think I would have immediately done something that would have gotten me canceled <laughs> and then forget a career. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, I would have been too vocal with my opinions. Honestly, uh, I come from the kind of people who um, are like, oh no, no, you get a job. Like there's no creative, no. I So I would do the same thing, I think. It was just like work my hourly clock punching job and then write on the side and hope that like someone noticed but I I still am sort of like I can't believe this is a career I can't believe I get to do this and I'm always prepared to like have them be like okay enough and then I you know will go like bag groceries or whatever so I would I mean every time I talk to like a group I used to do a lot of like talking to students and then I was like, no, I'm dumb as hell. Let me not talk to people in college anymore. But I would always be like, listen, my number one piece of advice is have a job so that your, your art, you're not relying upon your art to pay for your life. Cause then you can do what you want. Right. Like no one's going to let me write a butthole book and pay me like just right out the gate right but if I have a job and a paycheck and health insurance that some corporation takes care of then I can be free to be myself in my work so I would say don't aspire to the writing of it all like get a job get good at something you don't have to go to college just like get a cog in the wheel job take care of yourself and then do your art on the side and do whatever you can to advance it. So yeah, we, I, I oh sorry, I just no, add no, I yeah, I don't want to over glorify the hustle, but I also agree like once you're doing your quote unquote dream job or your art full time, like that kind of changes your whole mentality towards it like when it is your route to health insurance. Like I feel like I probably did some of my best writing when I was temping and I had a blog that I would write on instead of doing my work. Like when yep. you're doing it kind of out of spite mm -hmm. or resentment, that really fuels you. Yeah. So I would like, we're closing in, but I, I found something in the course of my research, a partner that world is one news rated you among the 11 funniest Asian female stand-up comedians <laughs> wow. of all, all time. Oh my Whoa. God. I have no idea. I have no idea. For your, quote, intelligent and witty humor. And I can tell you, you're number two on the list of the 11 Jeez, Asian female stand-ups of all time. But I would love to get at both of you about this question of representation. Because when you were like coming up, I imagine, as that 15-year-old not thinking about a career, there were not a lot of people just on the face of both of you that you could probably identify with working in the fields in which you're killing it right now. So I wonder if you ever feel a responsibility or you get those letters or just what it's like to be the identifiable possibility model for someone who you frankly didn't have yeah wow I, well I never think of myself that way and that is very no, it's sure. very cool to think that someone might look at what I do and think I can do it too because they can um <laughs> like it, it's achievable um I mean, I think that's awesome. When I was a kid, I loved like Nell Carter and like Marsha Warfield. You know what I mean? Like you kind of grizzled old black ladies, like Shirley from What's Happening. Like I went <laughs> as Shirley for Halloween more than once. Um, 
and so I I love that like that now we're sort of expanding at least what especially like fat black women can be like they don't just have to be the maid or the mom or the nanny or whatever and so I love kind of being that like hey you can be a person who isn't just like okay girl although I mean that's fun too but on tv like being a sidekick to someone else um so I don't if I can provide any inspiration literally to anyone like to people with constant diarrhea or to little black girls like whoever it is uh an honor and I would like everyone to know that if I could do it you truly can I don't know anything I couldn't tell you where anything is on a map I don't know shit and somehow I have this career so it's possible yeah I think going back to our original uh the your first question about you know maybe feeling like an outsider growing up I think I agree like similar sort of answer in that I never I never really felt like I fit in with, you know, other Indian people or like white, my white peers that I grew up around. Like, so I never really knew what the model I was trying to go after was. So the idea that other people are looking to me for inspiration is, yeah, like hard to even fathom. But it's like when I was little, like my goals were like, how do I become a dog or a horse? You know, like I... (laughs) like all the books I read were like starring dogs and horses. I was like, how do I get out of the whole human game? It's not working for me. So I think just, I hope I relate to anyone who also, you know, just feels like sometimes just fully out of touch with other people, period. So we are closing in now, just finally. I I have a million questions I'd love to pepper you all with, but we stand in support with the writers and what's happening right now. So I wonder just before we get out of here, in addition to reading each of your respective books, if there is something that you recommend that we all revisit, rewatch, binge, since we are not going to uh, be getting any new content until those studios come correct. So anything that we should be watching, reading in the interim? Yes. I I can't believe I slept on it for so long, but I Mm. just watched both seasons of Detroiters. I it I just I scream laugh (laughs) every episode. (laughs) Screaming you know, like black people screaming right, at right, right. the TV, throwing shit at the. T- it's so <laughs> funny. I, it's like a crime that it got canceled. D- Detroiters. It's so good. It's so funny. I will not say anything more about it because I want people to just okay. experience it. Discovered. But it's on. It's on uh, Paramount. Yeah, it's on Paramount Plus. It incredible tim robinson i know everyone loves i think you should leave but like detroiters is is it okay that's noted detroiters adding it to my rotation a partner oh. okay i'll co-sign detroiters but i will i will plug two books that uh, also are have just come out or are about to come out um uh one of my favorite comedians maria bamford just wrote a Mm. memoir called sure i'll join your cult which i read it's amazing incredible if you know her brain or if you don't i think people will just be blown away by it and then my friend who's uh also a wonderful comedian joe firestone just self-published a psychosexual murder mystery called murder on sex island that is out in october and she is also releasing it as an installment uh, of a series of installments of podcasts where she will be reading it and i highly recommend her voice is incredible oh my god voice she's the best no thank you for those and i'm like i'm gonna sneak one more in since you brought it up the the detroit is being canceled i wonder if there was a project that either of you have worked on whether it was your pilot or a show that has not met the light of day or has been canceled that you would like to resurrect judge joe Mathis style 
like something oh. that like, went away. Like I, I was one of the ones who loved Shrill. I watched every episode. That mm-hmm. bikini, uh, that at the pool party was phenomenal. So oh, any, anything you. that you worked on each of you individually that you would like to see maybe revived like I said in the resurrection of Judge Joe uh to judge that this style I uh am gonna say Tuca and Birdie it was an animated series that was first on Netflix and then on Adult Swim and I worked on seasons two and three and it's so good. Lisa and Raphael, they they did, uh, oh my God, what's our other show? Bojack, Horseman. Like, Duca always flew too low under the radar for my liking. Um, and it just, like Lisa's mind, you want to talk about somebody's mind, Lisa's mind just unreal also i got to work with maria bamford on an episode and like i mean she's she's the truth jennifer lewis i mean it's just it was so, so good and if, putting their voice to that thing oh god it was saved once like after netflix canceled it but if if we could get that going again that would be amazing oh i'm gonna be uh selfish and say hey let's bring back totally biased with w Kamau bell it was my first writing job and i, I would love that sweet wga insurance again. <laughs> yeah 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 you don't want to be us i'm on my wife's insurance <laughs> like... oh, let's talk about what's real <laughs> aspire to marry someone with the blue cross pbo is what you should aspire to <laughs> they should have a dating site for just based on people's health insurance <laughs> for real do we we should we learn how to code <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good fallback gig for everyone on the picket line right now. (laughs) Learn how to code and put some good into the world. Well, thank you both for joining me. This was more fun than anyone should be entitled to as we're filming this. Aparna and Samantha, thank you. Everyone, please remember that you can order their books below. And please consider making a donation as well to the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is celebrating its 18th year, we're legal, y'all, of presenting <laughs> literary programming. And just a gentle reminder that if you are in the New York City area, and Brooklyn specifically, Samantha Irby, the in-person <laughs> festival takes place on October 1st in downtown Brooklyn. We appreciate you so much. We can't wait to book club both of your selections, have them in our headphones, laughing out loud on trains as one of my colleagues just told me her kids made her take it out of her ears because she was embarrassing them on their (laughs) Eurorail vacation. But uh, thank you so much to both of you. Much continued success. Thank you. This was a joy. Yes, thank you, Brian. Thanks for having us. Thank you.